15 minutes later. So, still one minute left. Just waiting for people to join back. Is anybody in the house? Could you give me a WhatsApp in the chat? Meanwhile, I'm going to check the channel because I'm pretty sure I made a huge mistake. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, this is me. Okay, we know. Nope, nothing happens here. Okay, so I cannot just I cannot see it right now. I see zero people connected, however, so I'm going to wait a little more. Okay, one person connected now. So people are slowly joining back. Hopefully. Are you? <laughs> Hello world, this is me. Life should be. Mm -hmm. Coding for everyone. Okay, two people connected. Okay, you are slowly getting back to me. Nice. Can I see this in the dashboard of the mobile app instead of the computer, which is probably a little better? Um, I think I'll lose completely all the all the chats that I had so far, but still, at least I see now that we've got just one viewer. I really hope it was clear that the stream was not over today and we just had to have a 15 minutes coffee break. <laughs> this could be a huge technical problem. Let's see who's joining back. I just see one viewer and it could be even myself. No, it's PNTM, hey! Hey PNTM, sorry, but uh, was it clear that we had a 15 minutes coffee break and then we, uh, we would continue? Yeah, I think it was. Was it? Okay, you think it was clear, nice. So, okay, let's wait a little more because there's uh, people still enjoying their coffee, probably. I think I already made a huge mistake, uh, mistake because I, I closed the stream and uh, I probably shouldn't do this. Otherwise, the previous stream that was uh, already recorded and saved on Twitch will be overwritten by the current uh, stream. Luckily, I am uh, recording everything locally and I'm going to upload everything on YouTube, so we're not losing any videos. But still, that's if it's like that, it will be a lesson learned. I don't remember PNTM, where are you from? Okay, the chat is not really working here. Where's the chat? Was not told during the session, I believe. Probably it should be noted somewhere just to make sure that when a user joins, they wouldn't think that the lesson is over. Oh, you are from Indonesia. Well, I thought I was uh, saying it uh, just before disconnected, but probably I was too quick to say it. And uh, yeah, that, what, that was already a, a, a little mess. Also, one thing that... I, quite stupid is that, uh, well, a technical problem is that I'm really, really bad in calculating dates and time zones. So I said that usually I do a coffee break after two hours of lesson 
and uh, I started a coffee break after just one hour of lesson because I was sure that I was speaking for two hours straight now, which is not the case. So yeah, still doing a little bit of messes around. I will improve. There's just you still. I really hope that they will not join in two hours. I'm not really sure that the stream manager is actually saying the truth. Hey man, what happened? The 15 minute break didn't update, so I had to restart the stream. Oh, okay, so this is what's happening. Thanks for the, for the update. Yeah, I, I did a stupid thing, thing which was uh, closing the stream and reopening it again after 15 minutes. Probably I should have just kept it uh, streaming there without closing it. So that was a stupid move from me, and I'm sorry. Uh, PNTM, you say that there are five people online, so people are joining back. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, probably there's uh, still not that many people. And also the chat is not really updating now. So, you see, we, we, we have some, uh, some technical problems. Okay, that was the, the first lesson, and uh, it's normal that it, that it happens like that. Okay, I'm going to continue hoping that people will still join and uh, and let's see uh, we don't have too many things to do oh you had to refresh okay sorry Veronica and sorry everyone else uh, that was a huge mistake by me I will never disconnect the stream and reconnect it after 15 minutes so thanks a lot for uh... okay to Vrai77 me too Sorry guys, technical problem and uh, it's the beauty of a live show, right? <laughs> PNTM just uh, shared the link to the slides. Uh, the Slack link, you will find it in the slides. So I'm going to tell you this, don't worry. Okay, now the chat is also uh, kind of working too. So I'm going to remove this. Okay, I think we can start. Um, so, practice time. When you see this slide, it means that I'm uh, expecting something from you. First, first of all, you can uh, navigate, you can point your browser to tinyurl.com. It doesn't really show too much. Tinyurl.com oh, tiny slash ic-academy, which is something that um, PNTM just shared on the chat too. So if you want, you can follow the link he he sent on the, in the chat. This is just the short version, the shortened URL for the folder that contains all of my slides, including this one. So if you open slide 00-introduction, you should be able to see all the slides that we are looking at today and, we, uh, and you will be able to click on these colored texts, which are actually links. So um, you can just click on this link on the slides, which is already a good exercise to check if you are tech savvy enough to follow a link, bookmark it, open the slide, find the right slide and click on the link in order to be invited in the Slack uh, community, in the Slack channel. Um, okay, I heard a noise, which is probably Nika, which I think is Veronica, that just joined. And also Bobby did a while ago. Who's Bobby? Are you... It's, it's, uh, is it PMTM? Hi, Nika. As you can see, when I need to mention someone, I use the at symbol and then the name of the person but I'm pretty sure that you know these things because they are uh... oh it's Jabata okay Jabata is Bobby so I'm gonna call I'm gonna try to call you Bobby then <laughs> you're here that's so lovely to see you there oh yeah PNTM was there for, for a long time I'm sorry because I have uh, s some people that have nicknames which are different in Slack Tina Reban, I never understood how to pronounce your name, but I know you. I know you in real life. And I didn't expect you here. And it's so nice 
to see you here. So thanks for for joining. Tina, welcome. And now we've got also Rachel. Thank you, Rachel, for being here. Um, okay, so it's really, really working. Uh, Pipasta90. I love this nickname. <laughs> so welcome to Pipasta. Okay, so everything is working. I'm going to stop saying hello to everybody, otherwise uh, we're not getting anywhere. So, okay, that was a good first exercise. We, you went to the slides, you found the link to Slack. It's expiring soon, which means that in two days this link will not be valid, and I will issue a new link, which will last for another two weeks. And I will probably update these slides so they have the new link. So if, anyone's jo if anyone joins uh, after two days, they are still on time to join Slack. Uh, so no worries about that. So first of all, this is all about setup. And I would like to set up the computer with you guys. I don't know if you saw it already, but I'm not actually using uh, a classical operating system, which I mean, I I'm not using Windows and I'm not using a Mac. What I'm using here is... Linux. It's a distribution of Linux called Ubuntu, which is very, very popular among geeks. Uh, there are so many other distributions, but I'm sticking with Ubuntu. And uh, I know that probably most of you are using Windows, actually, not Linux. Or some of you could even have a Mac. If you have a Mac, this means that you're rich. So why are you here? No, don't, don't, I'm joking. So uh, I'm not going too much in detail on Macs, also because I don't have much experience on Macs, and also Macs are really, really similar to Linux. So you, do, you shouldn't have any problems if I develop on Linux and you are on Mac. But if you have Windows, probably there are a couple of things that we have to, to do. So I have a virtual machine, which has Windows. Do you see my Windows machine? I just need one that says, yes, I see it. Yep, okay, thanks, Veronica. So this is a, a beauty of engineering. We, I have a software that is simulating a computer which is running on my physical computer. And virtual machines are very common nowadays um, when, when dealing with uh, uh, enterprise solutions uh, or web applications that run on the, on the web. So this is a virtual machine, a virtual machine, which means that it's uh, it's simulating a real machine running Windows, but it's actually a software, which I think it's nuts. So in Windows, you probably know how to open your files manager. I have an icon here which opens the file manager, but I'm pretty sure you can find one uh, also somewhere else. It's called File Explorer, sorry. And if you don't find it, that's no problem. You can just uh, open the window. Uh, explorer here and just start typing the words file explorer and you should find the file explorer so multiple ways to find this application which is the file explorer I know that it's stupid it's pedantic maybe all of you know it already but I have to make sure that everyone knows how to open the file explorer so if I open the file explorer in any uh, way possible I should find something like this right and uh, in here, you can explore all your folders and all your files. I'm going to the My Documents folder, which contains nothing at all. And uh, I'm going to create now one file. You can do it with me if you want, but yeah, well, let's do it. So you can right click in this uh, document folder and you can do New Text Document or even rich text document if you want, but I'm going to go very basic with a text document. So I, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to click on the file explorer, opening it somehow. I'm going to go to the documents folder, which is currently in my quick access section, but I can find it also somewhere else. That's uh, It can be any folder actually, but let's stick with the documents folder. And then I right click and I do new, text document in order to create a new empty text document. Does anybody have any problems with that? And I'm asking this in order to understand what kind of audience I have now. Uh, don't say no, just say yes if you have any problems with that. 
Of course not. Okay, Veronica, nice. Nice to hear that. Yeah, it's really trivial, I know. Uh, okay, so I'm clicking on text document and I'm going to write it as, uh, I don't know, I'm going to call it Hello World. Because Hello World is the usual sentence that every uh, programmer does in any technology. Whenever you start using... Uh, can I use location like different drive? Yes, yes, you can. You can do whatever you want. We, we are just uh, playing around right now. Um, so as I was saying, whenever you learn a new technology in programming, you usually start by creating a hello world program. So it's a program that just prints the, the word hello world. And in fact, it's, uh, it will probably one of my catchphrases. Whenever I start a streaming, I will probably say hello world. So, as you can see, this is an empty text file, and you know that probably, you probably know that files have a name, but also have an extension. And this is the problem with Windows, because you see the name, the file name, but you don't see the file extension. But in programming, file extensions are quite important, so we don't want to just see hello world, we want to see hello world.txt which is the extension of the file, which tells me that this is a text file, a text document. So one thing that I'm asking you right now is to go to view, this uh, view tab here in the toolbar, I don't know how it's called. And if I click on view, there are so many options that we can uh, use. Uh, one thing that I would like is to check these two checkboxes here. One is file name extensions. So if I check on this, What's happening? Okay, if I check on file name extensions, the name, the, the extension of the file will be now visible. And probably it would be, it will be useful later on also to show hidden items. If you don't want to right now, that's no problem. But sometimes we have to deal with the, some uh, system files that will not affect your computer in any way. Don't worry, you will not break your computer. But some system files are more easily reachable when you show hidden items on the computer. So I'm going to click there. I clicked on hidden items and now hidden items are visible. How do I know that? Well, I just give it for granted, but if I really want to check if a hidden item is visible, I can go to, for example, this PC. And uh, in this PC, I can find the C drive users folder and you can see just the, right now that the default folder, which we, we actually don't know what it is, but it has a dimmed icon, um, which, which means that this is a hidden folder. If I uncheck hidden items, the default folder will disappear. Yep, it did. So one thing that I want instead is to have these hidden items visible. And going back to the documents folder, now I see hello world.txt. So now I see the file extension, which is usually pretty important uh, in programming. Does anybody of you have a Mac instead? Let's see if someone says, yes, I have a Mac. Is my microphone on? Yeah, it is. Yes, Ray has a Mac. So you're using a Mac. And uh, I could assume that on Macs you don't have any problems with file extensions. Uh, is that the case? Do you see the extension of a file if you create it? Yeah, you see it. Okay, so no more work to do on Macs. That's already fine. And uh, you're a, a, a bit unlucky if you have a Mac because I'm not going to show you anything Mac related, but you have to understand what I say and adapt it to your environment. Um, but still, it will be really, really easy. So we're starting really slow, maybe too slow. Don't worry, if I'm going too slow, I will go faster. This is the, th the, the thing that we've done together. Show file extensions and hidden files. Another thing that we have to do, and we can do it later on, we don't need to do it right now, is to install these three pieces of software. One is called Git, and it's the source versioning tool that we are going to use in order to build our portfolio and, um, and, and in order to share code together. We will install Node.js, because Node.js is the runtime environment of JavaScript and we will start using it as soon as we start the JavaScript part. 
and you will also you, uh, install Visual Studio Code, which is a text editor made by Microsoft. It's completely free and it's uh, probably one of the best uh, editors for code. When you code, you can use whatever text editor you prefer. You can even use Notepad or Notepad++ for those who know it, or any text editor is fine. But advanced editors such as Visual Studio Code give you a little bit more. They have uh, syntax highlighting, they give you some suggestions when you code, uh, they allow you to integrate easily with uh, Git and source control versions, they integrate the terminal, so it's really, really convenient to have uh, Visual Studio Code installed as an editor. So how do we install all these things? I am uh, going back to Windows and I'm opening my favorite browser. Well, not my favorite, but it's the browser that I use most uh, for programming and it's Chrome, but every other browser is okay. In fact, you can see that I have pretty much every browser installed. I have Chrome, I have Firefox, I have Edge, Safari, even Internet Explorer. I just don't have those uh, Brave, Vivaldi or Matrix browsers, but I have the most common ones. And I'll, I'm opening Chrome and the first software that I want to install is called Git. So I just uh, Google Git. You know how to Google stuff, right? So I search Git on Google, G-I-T, which is a beautiful piece of software developed by Linus Torvalds, which is the same person that created the Linux operating system. And I can click on Git. The first result is fine. And in this page, I will be able to download Git for Windows. If some of you have an unstable uh, connection or, or, or a not so fast connection, I don't want you guys to, uh, to uh, try to install things and not be able to follow the stream uh, at the same time. So this is something that you can do even later on by yourselves if you prefer to watch the stream and not do this with me. So don't worry about that. Still, I'm going to do it just to make sure that everybody is able to do that. So I'm clicking on save on this um, wizard, this pop-up. And uh, I'm going to click on the downloaded item. I'm going to say, yes, I want to install Git for Windows. And that I'm never going to use it because I'm going to use Linux and I have Git already installed on Linux. Does anybody here have Linux? Pretty sure you don't. It's a niche thing. Only you should, developers, engineers, and uh, STEM. Yeah, you've got Ubuntu, Pipasta. Okay, nice. That's awesome to see to hear. Uh, do you need help in installing Git on Ubuntu, or do you know, already know how to do that? Oh, Veronica, you have it in virtual box. So you're very tech savvy. Okay, if you need any help in installing Git on Ubuntu, I can give you some pointers. But still, uh, it's okay, no problem, nice. Okay, I'm going to install Git, and usually installing things on Windows means downloading an executable just like we did, and then doing next, 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 next. Some softwares usually uh, take advantage of the fact that you blindly say next, 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 and also add uh, mischievous software along with that, but it's not the case of Git. So you can go next, that's fine, you go next, you say next, you say, well, I don't like Vim here. Uh, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, but that's fine, we don't, we don't care. Oh, it doesn't even know that we are have Visual Studio Code, so... Okay, I'm probably starting to just mess up. Let's go with next, next, next. That's fine. Uh, that's fine too. Next, next. I don't even want to know what it's doing. We don't want to go too much in details on that. So, yep, next, next, next. Oh my god, so many things. Yes. Yes. Okay, I think it's done. So, it's going to extract all the files. It's going to install them, uh, updating some environment variables somewhere. And then we will have Git available. Um, one other thing that I would like you guys to install actually is the Linux command line because nowadays the Unix shell or as we call it or the Linux shell, the bash, uh, is the most used. Um, 
while it's installing, I'm going to say you this. Uh, every operating system has a command line interface. Windows had something called MS-DOS. Well, not, not Windows, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm not being uh, precise. Uh, Microsoft started by creating an operating system called MS-DOS, Microsoft DOS. And then they created Windows 3.1, which was actually a graphical user interface for that operating system called MS-DOS. MS-DOS was an operating system all by command line. And Windows was the graphical user interface that allowed you to not use the command line. Nowadays, Windows is the operating system and the command line is just a part of it. So I'm going to not view the release notes and close it. So what I'm saying is that Windows has one command line which is called the command prompt. The command prompt is something that looks like this and it's really really bad. It's, uh, it, it's not really powerful or probably not really standard as the shells, as the command lines that we have in Linux and Mac. In fact, the command prompt has been uh, superseded by another kind of terminal that is already available on Windows and it's called the PowerShell. So I'm going to look for the PowerShell here. Windows PowerShell. The PowerShell, as the name states, it's a little more powerful and a little more colorful too. You can see it's a, it has a blue background instead of a, of a black background. But still, some things have become a little more standard. Some things are not as standard as in Linux and uh, in uh, Mac. In fact, recently Microsoft decided even to add the Linux shell inside of Windows and you can install it on the store. Don't do this with me. I'm just going to show you. If I, uh, if I uh, um, open the Microsoft Store and I look for Ubuntu, you will see that you are able to install an app called Ubuntu. What is that? This is the Ubuntu Linux terminal working inside of Windows. So if you want to develop and use a, a terminal which is standard, don't use the common prompt. You can use the PowerShell if you want, but probably Microsoft is starting to recommend to use the Ubuntu terminal. I even heard rumors, I don't know if they are uh, correct, that Windows wants to, well, turn Windows into a Linux-based operating system. I don't know if that's true, but that would be awesome for me. But still, uh, you can install the Ubuntu shell, but I'm not going to do that with you now because as soon as you install the Git uh, versioning uh, tool, you now have Git Bash. You should find, among the recently added applications, you should find Git GUI, Git CMD and Git Bash. And if I open the Git Bash, this is already a Linux terminal. So this is actually uh, a standard terminal that we can use uh, and not care anymore about the command prompt and the PowerShell. Okay, so if we really need at a certain point we will probably also install the Ubuntu shell but I think you can go fine with the PowerShell or even this uh, shell that was automatically installed for you when installing Git. We'll never use the command prompt pretty sure that I don't want to go into that path. So this is how you download Git. Does anybody have any problem with that? Do, are you stuck with the installation? Are, is your connection not good enough to do it right now and you want to do it later? If you want to do it later, we will still be in contact on Slack, of course, and we will communicate on Slack. So don't worry, you're not left alone for a whole week uh, until the next stream. So if I don't see anyone uh, objecting, I will go on. You have to do it later. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Okay, but uh, uh, you will have my and our support to do that. Okay, don't do it right now. So this was Git. Another, oops, another uh, thing that I need you to install, which is not necessary immediately right now. You can do it even uh, after a few weeks because we're not going to use it immediately. But it's Node.js. 
So I'm still going on Windows and I'm going to show you how to install Node.js. I'm going to Google Node.js or Node.js, how you like it. You can even write Node. Node is so famous nowadays that when you look for Node, it will never show you Nodes. It will show you Node.js as the first result. And you go to the homepage of Node.js, which is actually Node.js.org. And after, after noticing that Black Lives Matter, which is very important, you can install one of these two. The LTS, which means long-term support version, which is uh, an older version, but a little more stable. And the current version, which is the latest version, probably could be a little unstable, but I never experienced any issues with current releases. Recently, I heard someone that suggested me to install the 12, version 12, instead of uh, version 14, because 14 was not 100% uh, compatible with the... Yep, sorry. Uh, was not completely um, compatible with some packages, I don't know. It's actually pretty the same. Um, I'm going to go with the LTS, but just to make sure that everything will work out of the box with no um, with no surprises. So I'm going to click on the 12 LTS and it's going to download this package and you will see that installing Node, Node is exactly like installing Git. You just download one thing and then you do okay, okay, next, 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 next until the pop-up closes. Uh, it's almost done or probably it is done. I'm gonna click it. No, it was almost done. And this will install Node.js on Windows. What about Macs? I think that for Mac, you will, uh, as always, uh, 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 you will download a DMG file, which is a disk image, and you mount the disk image, and you move the application from the disk image to the applications folder. You know better than me about Macs. I'm going to, oh, wait a second. I'm going to say next. I accept the terms, because if you don't accept the terms, of course, you'll never be able to, to install it. You do next, 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 and we've done it. And yes, Windows is asking me, do you really want to install this thing that so I you just downloaded from the internet? Yes, I want to. So Node.js is installing and Node.js is, is not a fancy application. Just like Git, it's mostly a command line tool. So you can use Git and Node mostly by using a terminal. A terminal like the command prompt, the PowerShell, the Git bash or the Ubuntu uh, console. Of course, Macs have a terminal too. It's uh, usually called, uh, I think, terminal. Uh, we have different names, but we will get back to that. And we also do some exercises on the terminal in uh, future lessons. So if uh, anything that I, uh, that I say sounds uh, strange to you, don't worry, everything will be clear. Okay, Node.js is installed and there's nothing to see because Node.js is not a graphical application. It is installed, but if I click on it, I don't even know what happens. It's opening a terminal, <laughs> you can see. And I don't even know what, ter what kind of terminal it is, but I don't care right now. So it's nothing very nice to see. I'm going to close this terminal. So Node.js is installed. And the last thing that we need to install according to the, um, the slides is called Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is this beautiful code editor, which you can see already installed on Linux here. You can just download it for Windows. It's going to open the usual pop-up in which you save the file. This, oh, this was really, really fast for me. And, um, and again, we go next, next, next. I accept everything you want. Otherwise, it will never install anything. I'm going to go up, up, up. And now Visual Studio Code will be extracted, installed and uh, configured on my system. I'm doing this just to show you, but I'm not going to code on Windows. I'm going to code on Linux unless we have some problems uh, for which, I don't know, my Linux box is too different from your Windows box. And then in that case, I will try my best to 
uh, to to have to 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 program uh, in an environment that you are familiar with. Uh, this checkbox is saying launch Visual Studio Code at the end of the installation, which could be a good uh, a good a good thing. So let's uh, finish the installation, and now Visual Studio Code is opening. And uh, it can seem quite strange, but actually this is just a welcome page for Visual Studio Code, and you can decide if you want to the, the welcome page to be shown or not here at the bottom. One cool thing about Visual Studio Code and you will see it happens uh, l lots of uh, times in lots of applications, is that on Windows I can use Control plus and Control minus to change the font size. And it's something that I'm going to do so you will be able to read the, the text in uh, a little better. Otherwise the text will be too small for you. I'm going to close this thing because I don't care about it. And you see that you can show the welcome page on startup or you can not show the welcome page on startup because you don't care about it. I'm going to skip the welcome page now and close this tab. So this is a text editor. It's a dark text editor, which doesn't mean that we are evil. In fact, developers in the years found out that a uh, dark background is more easy on our eyes. So nowadays we usually prefer a dark background because we can work more without having our, uh, uh, our eyes aching for the too much brightness. But if you want, there's also a light theme if you prefer a light theme. And then it's just a text editor. You can do new file and you start writing, okay? So, nothing more than a text editor. Well, actually, there's a lot more than a text editor. But for now, we just need to know that this is a text editor. One thing that I suggest you to do in order to have Visual Studio Code always available on your computer is you see the icon here on the bottom in the, how is it called, uh, application bar? Uh, I right-click on this icon and I say pin to taskbar. If I pin an application to the taskbar, it means that I can close the application. Whoa, not this one. I can close the application and I will see have still have the icon here available to be clicked once again and open once again the, the, the text file. PNTM says, one thing, is there a certain recommended PC laptop specification for coding activities? Uh, not recommended. Um, as, as far as I, I it, for my experience, we need a lot of RAM. That, that is probably the most important thing. A RAM, as you probably know, is a short-term memory of the computer, which uh, can be seen as the space you have on a desk. The wider the desk, the more application you can keep on the desk at the same time. If the desk is too small, you can just put only a few things on the desk and whenever you need to put some other things on the desk, you have to close and remove one thing in order to make room for the next one. Unfortunately, all the things that we're going to use are really RAM expensive. They are RAM consuming. So having Visual Studio Code open and having Chrome open and having other programs open at the same time will require some RAM. And if you don't have enough RAM, you have to close one application in order to have another one open. Uh, otherwise, you will see the computer really, really slowing down. And uh, I had the experience with uh, eight. Oh, okay, exactly. I had the experience with eight gigabytes of RAM. And for what we are going to do, eight gigabytes is sufficient. You could have some slowdowns from time to time, but you will still be able to follow this uh, this academy. Uh, as soon as you can, as soon as you earn uh, your first salary, maybe you will want uh, 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 a more capable computer. Uh, currently, I have a 32 gigabytes RAM computer. It's an old computer, actually. I bought it uh, probably five years ago, the, the day I started going freelance. But I wanted a very powerful computer because I wanted it to last uh, for, for a long time. So 32 gigabytes will allow me to have uh, Slack and Chrome and Visual Studio Code and uh, VirtualBox and OBS open at the same time. But this is just for me. For you, you just need to have one Chrome tab with the stream, one Visual Studio Code, 
well, probably the terminal or the terminal integrated in Visual Studio Code. You will see what, what it means later on. And of course, another tab uh, for uh, to see the results of your uh, of your programming. But still, yeah, I think that eight gigabytes can be good. But uh, if uh, Zubair is still here, I could ask him because he had a computer with eight gigabytes and he followed my latest course. So maybe he can uh, tell us more if he had any issues with the uh, slowdowns uh, on his computer. Okay, so that's it. Um, if you haven't installed Git, Node and Visual Studio Code, that's fine. You can do it later after the stream has ended and uh, you can do it with the help of the community on Slack if you have any issues, any problems. Uh, we can even have uh, some face-to-face -face, um, debugging, maybe on, uh, I don't know, on Google Meet. I, I really like Google Meet. Or uh, I'm not going to open a stream on Twitch just to have uh, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, troubleshooting with, uh, with one of you. But still, we can use any means we, we prefer. Um, okay, so I think I'm done with Windows. This is how we install things on Windows. Uh, I think that uh, the Ubuntu user will not have any problems whatsoever, but you, if you have any problems installing Git, Node or Visual Studio Code, I can definitely help you. Uh, most of all, you can... Uh, most of it, you can achieve it through the software center of Ubuntu. So you go to Ubuntu software, you look for... Uh, let's wait for it to open. My computer is struggling. Maybe I can even close window, but... Okay, so Ubuntu is, um, is opening the software center. This is uh, one of the reasons why we Ubuntu or Linux users are really spoiled. We don't need, even need to go to a website and download things. We have this uh, package manager that you are probably now used because you know the Apple store of your uh, Apple phone or the Play Store of Google. All these things are actually uh, a copy, a derivative of a thing that we always had in Linux, uh, package manager. So here you can look for Git and uh, it's browsing the catalog. And I don't know why it's not the first result. That's really bad. But still, you will be able to find Git somewhere here and install it. You will also find Visual Studio Code and you will also find Node.js you can very easily install. Okay, it's not good. It's not really giving me proper results. Let's see with Node.js like that. Okay, yeah, I found Node here. And uh, you can even look at that. Here on top, the top right, you can even select the channel, which means that you can def decide which version of Node you want to install. Apparently, I have installed the 14 Num version 14 in the stable branch, but if you want, you can also install the 12, version 13, version 11, etc, etc. So, mind this small select box, so you can install the proper way of, uh, uh, the proper version of Node. Then you can easily install also Visual Studio Code and Git in the same way, so really, really easy. Okay, so now we start doing real stuff. I'm sorry, this was just the setup phase. But now we're going to, to, to challenge ourselves. And uh, the challenges are just two games that I'm proposing to you. They are free online games that you can easily find. And uh, they are there to test you in a way because they test your uh, logic ability and your accuracy. And of course, if you see yourself not enough logic or not enough accurate, these games allow you to practice and, uh, uh, and obtain this uh, logical thinker attitude and improve your accuracy in typing. So don't worry, as always, if uh, you fail at first, because uh, we are here to learn. So it's, uh, it's a good thing to, to fail, actually, because only through our failures we can learn something. So we start going to Blockly Games, as stated in the slides. Uh, you can click on these slides or I can go just to the browser. I'm getting lost. Okay, I'm going to the browser and I say blockly.games. This is a very basic website, but I love it. Um, 
I discovered it through Power Coders, my friends who do the uh, coding academy for refugees. I didn't know about this. And uh, I will start showing you how it works. These are all different games. You see puzzle, maze, bird, turtle, movie, music, pond, tutor, pond. Okay. And we're going to start with the maze. So I'm going to click on maze. And this is a planning game. So here we are really behaving as programmers because we are programming a person to reach a certain goal. There is a, um, a tooltip that says stack a couple of move forward blocks together to help me reach the goal. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to click on run program and see what happens. Now that I run the program, I see that the person moved from left to right by one step and he didn't reach the goal. And why is that? Probably because in this white area, which I can call it the workspace, I have one block of code that says move forward. And move forward probably means that this person is going to move forward one step. So let's read again the tooltip. Stack a couple of move forward blocks together to help me reach the goal. What does stack means? Well, I'm tempted to try and select this move forward block and drag it by stacking it on top or below. You see that there's a hint that that's probably the best way to deal with these blocks. If I put it here, that is fine, but now a new tooltip will appear and says, well, on this level, you need to stack together all the blocks in the white workspace. So this is not stacking. This is stacking. And uh, Veronica says it looks a bit like Scratch. You got the point. This is Scratch. Exactly. It's using the Scratch language. The Scratch language is a visual language, is a block uh, block-based language that is actually very similar to programming and you will see how similar to programming it is in a while. So if I st stack these two blocks together now they are stacked and if I reset the program the person starts from the beginning of the path and if I run the program again I will see that the person now moved forward two steps so he reached the goal. Problem solved. Congratulations, you solved this level with two lines of JavaScript. What? Did I program in JavaScript? Yes, actually yes, because this visual language was actually hiding a detail, which was these two lines of code. Move forward, open and close parentheses, semicolon, and then move forward, open and close parentheses, semicolon. So the two blocks that I stacked together are exactly the same as writing these two lines of JavaScript codes. Sounds pretty easy. JavaScript is all about that? Not at all. But still, this is already a good way to start thinking on uh, how to use this, uh, on how to think logically. Another thing, I'm not going to do OK. I'm going to say cancel. Because as soon as I placed another block, I found another kind, uh, two kinds of block, left and right, which I didn't use in this particular maze but we are going to use these two other blocks, left and right, in uh, following mazes. So if we're ready for level two, I'm going to do OK. But is everything fine with this maze one? Or does anybody have any problem understanding what the game is about, how to move blocks, how to stack them? Because I had experience of people having problems stacking blocks. But if everybody's fine with that, we can go on. Okay, you see, I'm going really, really slow, and I, th I can understand it's a little boring. Don't worry, I will not be as trivial as I am today. I just need to make sure that everybody is on the same page, and then I can uh, go a little faster. Okay, let's go to level two. Now, the guy is here, facing right, and he has to do a zigzag turn in order to reach the goal. I already have a move forward block in the workspace and if I run the program I see that the person is now one step closer to the goal but not yet again. So my program did not solve the maze and I can reset and uh, plan the person's route in order to make him reach the goal. This is where people start moving things around. They say, okay, no, uh, he doesn't need to move forward, he needs to turn left, and then he needs to turn right. 
Is it true? He turns left and then he turns right. Then you run the program and you see that it's not solving. Uh, Angela says, I'm not afraid of you going slow. I'm afraid of when you'll be going fast. <laughs> and as soon as I go fast, you will tell me and I will slow down. So don't worry. Okay, yeah. I will go pretty fast at a certain point. So it's your duty to say, hey, slow down, man. I cannot catch up with that. Okay, so turn left and turn right didn't solve the problem. Why didn't it solve the problem? Let's go step by step. If I use only turn left and I run the program, I will see that the person was facing right and now it's facing, let's say, north. So turn left is not doing any movement. It's just turning, turning the person left or right. So as you can see, the person should first of all move forward. And then once he's at this angle, probably he should turn left. If you're unsure if that's the correct way to solve things, you need to use an experimental approach. Go step by step, move forward, run the program and see what happens. Okay, he's in this situation. So now what he should do? He should probably turn left so he can face north. So I'm going to stack a turn left. And this is another error that I did. Because if I reset the program and I run the program, this is not what doing what I uh, was thinking. Why is that? Because there's a, a specific order in which I should stack blocks. If I stack the turn left block on top of the move forward, this means that turn left will be performed before the move forward. In fact, this is what happens. The guy facing east started turning and facing north and then tried to move forward but he banged his head on the wall. So this is not the correct way. Instead, I should probably move forward and then turn left. So swap the two blocks together. And in that case, if I reset and run the program, I will see things are getting a little better. He moved forward in the right direction and now he's facing the right direction in order to continue. So if you understood the gist of it, I would love you guys to try and do this by yourselves. And uh, we can, I can wait for you guys to try right now, but uh, probably it's much better if you do this uh, by yourself as soon as the stream ended. It can seem really, really trivial for you right now because it's, uh, it's about planning a route, but you will see that on maze three and maze four, we start having more complex blocks, such as this repeat until do. And this is a different block and it's a different way to use this block. So you have to figure out by yourself how to use this block and how to use it in order to solve the problem. Then things will get trickier and trickier. As you will see, these mazes are becoming a lot more difficult until you reach level 10. And level 10 as you can see, it says, can you solve this complicated maze? Try following the left hand wall, advanced programmer only. If you challenge yourself with level 10, you will find that this is really, really difficult. And when I say difficult, I mean it's difficult for me. I will never find a solution fast. I will have to bang my head for a few minutes or maybe even hours if I'm tired, and then I will find a solution. But if you're smart, you will find a solution too. And if you're even more smart, and you probably are, you even find optimal solutions. For example, in this level in particular, but also level nine, you can solve in multiple ways. One way can have the least amount of blocks and one other way can have the least amount of uh, steps to follow. So it will just go straight to the point without wandering around. Uh, by this, I mean that this person, as you can see from this maze, could probably go um, right, up, left, then could probably do some stupid things uh, up here and then go back and go to the goal. This would not be the optimal solution. Maybe an optimal solution could be this guy go, going east, north, then all the way west until he reaches the goal without wandering around. So there's not just one solution, there are multiple solutions and some you can say that they are more, they, they are better, they are optimal, they, are, they use less blocks or they, they make the person wander around less. So this is the challenge that I give you. 
for those who are really at the beginning of uh, of this um, uh, of this kind of uh, um, of mentality, don't worry. You just need to try and solve mazes from one to nine. Don't even try ten if it's really too difficult for you. For those who are a little fast learners or have already some experience, try to go up till 10, level ten and maybe even find multiple solutions, some optimal solutions. The later level is fun, yes. The, the first two levels are really maybe too stupid. It's just to understand how the game works. It's just a, a tutorial phase. But then the subsequent levels are much more engaging. Also, this is the maze. If you still have time, you can go on with the bird, which has different kinds of blocks. So this, for example, is a program that if you run it, the bird goes by itself. You don't need to say move forward. It already moves forward. So what you have to control here instead is the heading. You want the bird to head, for example, in this case, 45 degrees. So the bird will catch the worm and will take it to the nest. Okay? And this is actually similar to the writing this piece of JavaScript code, heading 45 degrees. So, as you can see, these are games that can challenge you, uh, challenge your logical mindset, but they are also really important because they are, they are coding. They are coding with a visual language. And as soon as you understand coding with a visual language, we will be able to code with a real language, such as JavaScript. So we'll not stack blocks together. We will write the code that will uh, solve the problems. Uh, you can also look at all the other exercises, the other games. They are all very fun and engaging. You can even write some music with, uh, with one of these two games. So. Um, they are really, really nice, and I encourage you to, to, to explore them all. We have a week before the next stream, so I encourage you to try and maybe also share your progress on Slack and share your doubts. If you're stuck, you can ask for help, etc., etc. Also, I said that this is very, very similar to coding. The only difference with coding is that in coding you solve problems just like stacking blocks, but you do it by writing words, and sometimes it's difficult to write those words because, well, as the name says, it's code, it's not literature. So you have to write words, but they, have, they, they follow certain rules and you have to put parentheses and brackets and semicolons. And sometimes you mess up. Sometimes you don't find, oh my God, where's the bracket? I don't remember, where's the semicolon? That's why the next game that I'm proposing is typing.io. Typing.io is a, a game that I fun by myself, if I remember correctly. Typing.io. And it's a game in which you practice accuracy and speed in typing. But unlike other typing games, this will make you practice on real code. So usual typing games that you find online uh, just make you practice about words of the English language. But in this case, it's completely different. You are going to write some uh, code that you don't understand. That's fine. I don't understand this code. But still, it is code with all the special characters that we need in coding. So if you don't know where the, I don't know, the, uh, the bracket is, this is a good exercise to find the bracket and then practice on finding the bracket as, as quickly as possible. So I will show you this... Um, this exercise too. Uh, you can sign in with Google, but I usually go with try the demo, which means that you can use uh, the, the game right away. It will just not save your progress probably, but who cares about that? So I'm gonna try the demo. And as I said in the slides, I would encourage you to go with the JavaScript jQuery exercise, the JavaScript jQuery game, and the less bootstrap game because these are very similar to the kind of code that we are going to write together. There are other things like Objective-C, C-Sharp, Ruby on Rails. These are other programming languages that we are not going to explore in this academy. But if you have fun with this, go with it. You can use all the games that you want. I'm going to do the JavaScript jQuery. Click on the JavaScript jQuery. And now, as soon as I start typing the, uh, the, the first character, this game is going to track 
my progress. It's going to track the time, it's going to track my accuracy, my speed, and it's going to give me um, a final uh, summary on how well I went. This first level is actually pretty complicated and following levels will be a little uh, a little simpler. Here we've got so many strange characters. I don't even know how to, to name them, some of them. I don't know what this kind of character is. How do you call this? It's a... Uh, I don't know. It's probably something that, uh, that they use in, in languages that are not Italian. In Italian we, we don't have many marks on, uh, on characters. But still, some of them are really important as characters, so we need to practice on how to find them on our keyboard and how to find them effectively. So, I'm going to start, and I think it, it will take uh, one minute, one minute and a half. Let's see what happens. One, two, three, go! Okay, okay, I already did my first mistake. And this is also due to the fact that I'm trying to speak while I'm, oh my god, while I'm doing this exercise, which is even, oh, even more complicated. Nope. Okay, I'm doing a mess right now. Okay, is simple is equal to, look how many strange characters we have here, my god. Uh, I'm not really fast right now, and I don't care about this. It's just a way to show you how human uh, I can be and how bad I can do this kind of exercise. But bear with me, I have a surprise for you because I actually have a personal record which I'm pretty sure that you will never be able to beat. Even though I seem to be quite messy here, I still have done a personal record that I'm sure nobody will be able to beat, even if you try for a long time. Of course, there are, there's a catch in this, and I will show you. But still, as you can see, oh my god, also the spaces, var i l length, no. Oh my god, this is so strange. Okay. As you can see, I'm not expecting you guys to do it perfectly from the start. If uh, you do too many mistakes, you can probably slow down a little bit, and uh, or you can go as fast as you can, but you will probably make more mistakes. This is the summary of, uh, of my lesson. So, 305 typeable characters, 369 typed character, which means that I misspelled 13 characters, etc, etc. Um, I have a staggering 21% of unproductive keystroke, which is way too much. I took uh, a minute and 37, and the words per minute were, were 38. Uh, so, this is a really, really bad mark, actually. Uh, I could do better, so in order to do better, I can just try again. Or maybe continue with the, less, the next lesson and uh, go back to this lesson later on. Veronica says, don't say that, some of us might be super competitive, and actually I encourage this, let's be competitive. I'm sure, 100% sure, that you will never be able to beat my record, uh, even though I perform really, really bad. And uh, next time I will show you my personal record, and I will show you why you will not be able to beat my record. So, be competitive and uh, try to to write lots of code and to write it much better than I did right now. And let's see what will happen next, next week. So, this is the Typing I.O. game. You are going to type fast and accurate, and you're going to type the special characters that we require in programming. So, it's not just words, we need to have the equal symbol, the slash, the backslash, which is different from the slash, you have to uh, understand the difference between the slash and a backslash. And there are some other characters that we probably are not going to use really that much. For example, this character that I cannot pronounce. Uh, we usually use it in uh, a special thing called regular expressions, which is what we are seeing right now. But we are not going to 
to, to write many regular expressions. So I don't expect you guys to know this, uh, this cap. There's also another special characters that I don't see here, but it's very important. And the special character, I'm going to show it in Visual Studio Code. If it opens, it's opening. Okay, so the special character that I'm, that I'm talking about is the tilde character. The tilde character is really easy to, to do on Linux because, well, in my case, it's alt gr and the hat symbol that I don't know how to, uh, to pronounce, uh, to, to call it. This on my Italian keyboard. Maybe you have the tilde symbol immediately on your keyboard, uh, in your uh, keyboard layout. Maybe you don't. In my case, I don't have it. I don't have the tilde symbol on my keyboard. So I need to know that there is a special combination of character. The hat symbol is a carrot. Oh, thanks, Jabata. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Okay, it's a carrot symbol. This symbol here. This is a carrot. Glad to know. So the tilde symbol is a very important symbol and if you don't know how to do it, you have to find it somewhere. So you can say tilde symbol on Italian keyboard, for example, in my case. How do I enter the tilde symbol on an Italian keyboard or, or the back tick too? And I will find some answers to my question. Sometimes it's a huge combination of characters. Sometimes it's really easy to find. Uh, you have to prepare yourselves because in the following lessons you will have to know by heart uh, how to do those characters. Another kind of uh, difficult character that I know about is the square brackets. I know that square brackets on an Italian keyboard is a character that I have here but I also need to press the alt gr symbol. So I can do this with a combination of two fingers. And if I want the curly braces, I need to do a combination of three symbols, three characters pressed together. Alt, Gr, Shift, and that same character as before. This, in particular, is a very important kind of uh, bracket of brace that we will use a lot. So please um, practice a lot on creating this kind of, of uh, brace, of parentheses, and also this one, and also this one too. And uh, we already talked about the tilde symbol, which is very important. The caret symbol is uh, not really important. In HTML, one important symbol is the minus than, uh, the less than, and the greater than symbols. These two are really important too. So make sure that you practice on using, on, on uh, issuing these characters as fast as you can. They, they must become natural to you, just like uh, writing Hello World and not misspelling it maybe, okay? So, uh, I think that I told you everything that I wanted to tell you today. There's already many things to do because you have to install things and, and uh, interact on Slack and you have to do these games. So this slide actually covers another kind of topic which is starting to write a website together. So we start to dive in, but I think it's much better if we dive in next time, not today. Um, tell me what you think, of course, if you instead want to start right away, but I, I think it's better if we stop here. So it's um, 13.25, which means that we were online for uh, two hours and a half. And I think that as a presentation and as a setup, it can... Uh, it can, it can be good as a, as a first start. So now you have a grasp on how we are going to proceed, what pace, what kind of uh, enthusiasm we have, and, uh, and you can test yourselves with uh, all the tasks that I gave you today. So see you online on Slack, and uh, if you have any problems, feel free to reach out to me, uh, feel free to make friends with each other, I would love that. And uh, see you next stream, which will be next Saturday at 9 a.m. UTC, which means something different in your time zone. 9 a.m. UTC. If you Google it, you will probably understand what is in, in your time zone because Google gives you this answer. Apparently, it's 11 a.m. in tune where I am now. It will be another time in your time zone. But um, other than that, 
thanks a lot for attending this uh, first um, this first uh, issue of the Academy, which uh, you already know it's also my birthday. So thanks for celebrating my birthday this way. And uh, remember to eat pasta and code FASTA, okay? Over and out. Bye.